Hey everybody, this is Jerry. So, growing up in America, when you went through high school, what you probably learned from the textbook on history, American history, is that so we had the Gilded Age, the Roaring Twenties, where everything was all good, stock prices were good, and then in 1929 it crashed. Why? Because of free markets, because of rampant capitalism, because markets weren't controlled. And Herbert Hoover, that damn president, just believed in the free markets. And he just said the market will fix itself. And the market didn't fix itself. And then we had a savior called FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who introduced socialism into our economy. And that's what fixed our economy and got us out of the Great Depression. Well, that's not exactly the truth. If you really look into that period, especially Herbert Hoover's presidency, most people don't realize that Hoover was not a free market, pro-free market, pro-capitalist guy that we all think he was, or we've been led to believe by our textbooks. October 24th, 1929, that's when the stock market crashed and we went into recession and then we just didn't recover for a long time. So that's the start date, 1929. We had 579,559 federal employees with a federal budget of 3.1 billion. 1933, when Hoover left office, four years later, we had 603,587 federal employees. So the number of federal employees went up. That's not very free market. The budget also went from 3.1 billion to 4.6 billion. Hey, I thought Hoover was all free markets. Why is the federal government expanding? So what are some of the things that Hoover tried to do to help our economy? So one of the things Hoover did was called the Federal Farm Board, an organization institution created to stabilize farm prices. So let's go through very, very quickly the problem with stabilizing farm prices or trying to stabilize farm prices. So for those of you who've studied macroeconomics, this is your standard supply and demand curve. Supply is upward, demand is downward. Quantity is on the x-axis, price. So the more you have of something, the less benefit you get of it. First apple's good, 10th apple, oh. So that's why demand's going down because the more you have of it, it's the returns are diminishing. Same thing with supply. Think of supply as going like this. So think of this as the axis you're looking at. No matter how much you spend, eventually your rate of returns diminishing. If you have three people working on a task, for example, okay, they might get a lot done. If you have 20 people working on that same task, eventually that 10th person, that 11th person, that 12th person is just bleh, right? So that's why the supply curve is going up like this. Anyways, there's a point right here called the equilibrium. This is when the supply and the demand curve meet. And this is the point where if you let the market alone, it's where it would naturally fall. This is sort of the quantity that's producing the price. So now the farm board said, oh, oh no, the economy's going down. We need to artificially get the prices higher, make sure farmers can live. If this is what the prices are right now, but the government says, whoever's farm board says, no, we need the prices up here. So look what happens now. Because the prices are all high, farmers are overproducing, but no one's gonna wanna buy all that shit. You see all this? This is how much is supplied that's never consumed. So now you have a surplus. And so if you have a surplus, farmers wanna get rid of this surplus. So then, oh no, now we have to reduce our prices, sell it at an even lower price. So by trying to impose price controls, in the long run, fucked up the prices of farming goods even more. Initially led to too high prices and not enough consumers bought, and then it led to a surplus, which then the farmers try to toss. It's like you fuck over the farmers twice. Now Hoover also tried to implement wage controls because when an economy goes down, right, there's a concept in economics called sticky wages. Basically, if you're a company and the economy's going down, your economy and your sector's contracting, it makes sense for you to reduce the wages of your employees to make up for the fact that you're not making as much profit and you don't have enough money to cover all your costs. But of course, if I'm making $10 an hour and someone says, hey, you're only gonna make $5 an hour now, psychologically, I'm like, fuck you, you better not do that. 
Hoover decided to say, okay, we better stabilize wages. We better make it so if there's unemployment or if companies are losing money, they cannot lower their wages at all. If you artificially impose a level of wage and the company's losing money and the company can't lower the wages of its employees, what happens? It has to fire employees, lay them off because it can't afford to employ everyone. So with wage control, Hoover was a big fan of it, you end up leading to more unemployment than if you just let them cut wages. Sure, cutting wages is very inhumane, but in times of really bad recession when the stock market crashed, it's better for me to work at $5 an hour than not to work at all. Whatever amount of money that Hoover tried to set each sector to employ their employees by, it forced them to cut more employees than necessary. On top of this, we have the Tariff Act of 1930. One of the first things that Hoover did to quote unquote try to alleviate the stock market crash and the subsequent economic downturn was to sign into law a tariff. The Tariff Act of 1930, also known as the Smoot Holly Tariff. Senator Smoot, he worked at some influential committee in the Senate, and Holly was uh, the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives, I believe. So Smoot and Holly Tariff, also known as the Tariff Act of 1930. And what did this act do that Hoover signed into law? It raised taxes on imports on basically everything. So essentially about a year, give or take a few months, after the stock market crashed, Hoover decides, let's fuck over America on trade. And the thing about trade is it's not a one-way thing. When you fuck over other people, as in you fuck them from importing, they will stop accepting as many of our exports. What you do is you create a trade war when you start overtaxing. And what the Smoot Holly tariff did was it taxed foreign goods at a rate never seen before. So I wish I had the statistics in front of me, but I don't have the books and everything in front of me. Our question that we were trying to answer in this video is, was Hoover pro free markets? Was he pro capitalism? Just because he signed the tariff bill into law doesn't mean he wasn't pro capitalism, right? Maybe he was just misguided. Maybe his advisors told him this, or maybe the Congress forced his hand in this. Let me tell you this, the Smoot-Hawley tariff actually spent almost a year in Congress before it actually got passed in 1930. In fact, May 9th, 1929, so this was six months before the stock market crashed, Congress was already debating this tariff. Why was Hoover thinking about taxing foreign goods already even before the stock market crashed? It seems like he, he was already trying to intervene into the economy before the stock market crashed. So in college, I wrote this paper. I really looked at what was Hoover's motivation for this. And if you dig really deep into why this bill, this tariff spent a year before it got passed, it's because Hoover, actually what he really wanted was to expand executive presidential power. Traditionally, Congress passes the tariffs. Congress passes, okay, how much are we gonna tax foreign goods? But Hoover wanted something called a flexible tariff provision. Basically, he wanted himself, the president, to be able to set tariffs. Normally, presidents don't help set tariffs. He wanted it. That's the whole reason the bill spent a year before it got passed in 1930. The reason why it took so long was because the debate, the fight between Congress and the president, Hoover, was okay, how high the tariffs were, and two, whether to include the flexible tariff provision or not to let the president set tariffs. So eventually, Hoover just wanted the presidential power to set tariffs so freaking much that he said, fine, the House, the Senate, you guys wanna protect your constituents, you guys wanna set really high tariffs even though I don't believe in it? Do it, do it, I'll sign it, as long as you give me the flexible tariff provision. By wanting to expand, his executive branch power, Hoover sold out the whole nation on trade. This isn't free market, pro free market. He wanted more power in federal hands. And this is something people don't learn because the narrative to make FDR look like a saint because FDR was a four-term president, got us through World War II, you know, it's good to make him look good. We have to sort of contrast him with the president beforehand. And unfortunately, Hoover was the president when the stock market crashed. So it's easy to make him a villain, but he's, just as human and just as power hungry as any other human being that serves in office. And that's what this narrative 
doesn't give you if you don't look into it. When I wrote this paper in college, did you think I would find out all about this stuff? So in between June 30th, so after the bill passed, and December 31st, 1932. So in, in a two year span or one and a half year span, the commission that Hoover set up, there was about 300 employees. He spent about $2.5 million doing all this and they only investigated 74 tariffs. <laughs> so you spent 2.5 million and this is not adjusted for inflation. Over two years, you hired 300 new employees and you only examined 74 tariffs. <laughs> I hope what you're getting from all this is Hoover was not a free market advocate. He wanted to control the economy. He wanted to, he felt paternal. He felt like, you know, him and his federal government could go in and fix the economy. Whatever narrative that our textbooks give us, you know, I'm not going to say they're lying and maybe they're just simplifying it because, you know, history is long and you want kids to just get the general gist of it, which is FDR really expanded federal government. It's unfair to label Hoover as just a free market advocate because if you see from what I'm showing you, he was not a free market advocate at all. At freaking all. I thank you guys for watching. Leave your comments below and let me know, do you want me to cover more about the Great Depression? Do you want me to talk about this more? Because you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. If you took one thing away from this, Hoover was not a free market advocate. He wanted to expand federal power as much as anyone. Thank you guys so much. Talk to you guys next time.